Hello everyone, now it's finally my turn to talk. I have been talking at all during the last 24 hours. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be funny. Um, and I will talk about, well, I made it the big password picture. And first of all, authentication methods. First one is something you forgot. Forgot. Yeah, that's pretty close. And the next one, something you yes. forgot at home. And you have probably known all forgot your password. Battery is dead. The app crashes constantly. You know, like soft, soft tokens. Uh, or you, the CFO will say it's too expensive. So we'll continue just using passwords. And something you used to be. <laughs> Something you used to be, yeah, young and beautiful. Yeah, well, you need to watch Mythbusters and you really not want, should look into Minority Report movie as well. Because they, in my opinion, they do say something about something useful in a way about biometrics. I've got lots of slides, so this talk is, it, it, this is not going to be a tech talk. And I spent quite a few hours, I went to bed at approximately 2 a.m trying to decide which slides will I go through and not. So I have many slides for you, and this is just an attempt to do an overview of some of the things that I've been working on and thinking about. And, of course, I will end the presentation not by saying thank you, but asking you, would anyone like to get some more work to do? Because I have lots of uh, suggestions for you, for free, of course. So, some stories you would really not believe. Well, maybe except for this audience, of course. So here I'm at the conference, and you have seen these many, many times. Yellow post-its. There's a guy sitting next to me, and here's a phone number, the moderator code, and the participant code to get into the phone conference. And I've been diving into uh, phone meetings held by the board of directors of several companies before, and uh, I call in there, you know, a couple of minutes before the conference actually started muted my microphone and waited until they had introduced themselves and were supposed to start the meeting for the board of directors. And then I would say, hi, this is Pierre Tosum, and I've just got access to your financial data. Always funny to do. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am at my local car dealer. I was a new Volkswagen to one last year. And the car dealer had actually a small white note on his wall with the username and the password. Now I have removed the username but the password is Antel123, which is, of course, very hard to remember. And he actually left the room for like 20 minutes, so I was seriously considering giving myself a really good discount on that new car. But I didn't. And you, some of you may know me from, uh, from the LinkedIn leak in, uh, in June. I really need to set the uh, picture straight out. Uh, in a way, the leak was discovered <coughs> by CoreLogic, correct me if you can. They put out a tweet on a Tuesday morning to me, uh, saying that you probably should change your password on all major sites because, because something really big seemed to have happened. And just like many other, other people do, uh, when you see a message like that, you can go instantly to the inside profile in Russia to see if there are any new files being uploaded there. Or you can also go online on Pastebin and paste to another sites to look for, you know, a really big leak. And on Inside Pro, you know, like, oh, I seem to have lost my 6.5 million passwords. Can anybody help me recover that? Because that's probably that one. So this happened on June 5th to June 6th, and some of the interesting observations from that episode was that they were using unsolved SHA-1, which is, you know, I, I, I guess we all agree that it's not that much of a good idea to store your passwords using uh, sort of Shaw one But they also, uh, approximately two weeks after the incident, they also were interviewed, and in that interview, they actually said, we do not have a chief security officer. And as I have been saying in many other uh, presentations, if you have 160 million customers, and you don't have a CSO, and you get hacked, do not tell the media that you don't have a CSO. Just point at somebody and say, you're fired, because you have a CSO, now you're gone. But do not say that you didn't have a CSO. Also very interesting, myself, Norwegian SAP, and some other people tried to 
get hold of LinkedIn and tell them it looked like it looks like you have been hacked. They didn't respond. They didn't respond in any channel whatsoever to us. And we tried for several hours. And after that, I decided, well, screw them. I will call the media and say that people should change their passwords at LinkedIn. And even more knowledge based on that one is that the interesting fact is that on June 6th, the stock price of LinkedIn was at $93.08. And for the next following weeks, the stock price actually went up. So what can we learn from this? Well, all security people should be fired, and our new business strategy will be unsolved the sharp one, no CSO, no security, hoping that we'll get hacked, get famous, and get rich. New business strategy. <laughs> Simple point. Jeremy Gosling did some amazing work on cracking the LinkedIn hashes, just like many others of you did. And he went looking for passphrases. We found uh, a lot of interesting passphrases, of course. And the most, the funniest one is that there's a rock, I think it's a rock band in the US, named Jesus Christ of Supercar, which was more, probably, the, I would say that was, was the most funniest uh, passphrase found. And we also have, based on the presentation from Kirsi Hankala, because I think it was week two after the leak or something, um, I was actually reading through the paper from Kirsi one more time, and I noticed that you said in the paper that there were students using the primary color of the logo of the service provider as one of their memorable words in the password. So I just went online, Jeremy, 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 uh, did I order you to do it or did I ask my state? What do you think? You ordered it. Yeah, I ordered yeah, you to do it. Yeah. So I said, Jeremy, you have to do this. What I want you to do is I want you to search through all the passwords and look for words of colors like blue, yellow, black, white, and so on. And try to figure out if there are more occurrences of blue compared to red, white, green, and so on. And there's the result. There are many more people in the LinkedIn passwords using the color word blue than other colors in the passwords. Now, it could be coincidence because some other researchers have earlier looked at color, the use of color on the internet. And they say that the primary color, the most common color on the internet is blue. So I really want somebody to look into more leaks looking for color words and eventually classify the words found, the base words, into different categories like colors, humans, pet names, and so on, to have a look at what kind of words, type of words, classes of words are most commonly used in passwords. Because that is something that I find really interesting, because that has to do with human psychology to me. This one is nice. Copenhagen Airport, Denmark. You can get paid access for Wi-Fi, or you can get free access. So make your choice, people. Paid access or free access? Well, I went for free access. So in order to get free access, you need to sign up for membership and get free Wi-Fi. So I fill out, fill out this really long form, name, address, phone number, sex, age, all kinds of information, and click Submit. And then I was told by this genius system, we have now sent you an email with a link that is valid for 10 minutes that you need to click on to verify your account before you will get internet access. <laughs> so I went for the paid access option. <coughs> Wonderful. So I'm really interested in security usability as well. And you have probably seen this. This one is one that I tweeted. And uh, this is another one. And here you can see that this is from one of the major property providers in Norway. And they are issuing fiscal access cards where everyone is being given the same pin. And then they are encouraged to change it. They don't have to. That's the result. The other one, you can see the grease marks from your fingers, fat, on the keys. Now, this is somewhere not really important, 
And this is London Stansted Airport. <coughs> That's not really good. This was, was tweeted uh, last week. Now, University of Cambridge colleagues from Seattle have made these heat maps of pin codes, and you can read the uh, entire report here. They are based on pin codes found in passwords from Rocket Leak, and you also have the data obtained from the Big Brother app for iPhone, where one guy collected approximately 220,000 pin codes and heat mapped them. And I saw that report, I really liked it, saying that some 78% of us are using one out of as little as of 100 different pin codes. So entropy is kind of really low. And they also say that if they can get hold of 100 Visa cards, as an example, they would be able to guess the correct pin statistically for 9% of the cards in a maximum of three attempts. That's kind of interesting. So what I did, when I was finished at work that day, I was driving back home, and as I, as I usually do, I called my friend and former colleague, Jan Fredrik Leverson, he's plus on internet, on Twitter, and I said, I like this, and I want something similar. So you have to make it for me, because I can't even do a DOS <coughs> batch shell in, in a batch script in MS-DOS. So he took the challenge, and the next morning when I woke up, he said, it's done. So you can go online at radical.org slash pinmap right now, and then it's client side, just put in, drag and drop, a simple text file that has one pin per line, and then we we'll get a heat map pretty similar to that. So we that, did that for physical access cards, and even though we didn't have that many pin codes available, we are seeing the same pattern on how people are choosing their own pins. So you have Rockview, you have iPhone pin codes, and then you have physical access cards. This one's fun. Many, many years ago, um, I have been primarily cracking Windows passwords for 13, 14, 15 years. During engagements, penetration testing engage, engagements and security audits. This was for one of, well, it was for somebody somewhere in a galaxy far, far away a long time ago. And I was working there myself. And I did password cracking from a Windows domain, and I saw that there was one specific user who was using eight digits, digits as his password, so it's easy to crack. And eight digits in Norway will usually be a phone number. So I looked it up online. <coughs> Nobody had that number. Okay, it could be a secret number because you can have yourself a secret or hidden phone number in Norway. So I called that number. There was a woman who replied on the phone, and she used the last name of a very good colleague of mine. Uh -huh. So I called my colleague, and I thought, you know, I, I know the guy pretty well, so I can play a little joke on him. So I called him and said, do you know this number, blah, 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 blah. And he went completely quiet for a couple of seconds. And then he said, how the fuck did you get access to my root password? I didn't, but you just told me. <laughs> and then he was like, crap. <laughs> so he was a Unix sysadmin, and he was using the same password, his hidden secret phone number, as his root password and as his Windows password. Password history is a parameter in Windows and other systems that I found really interesting because. On Windows systems, you cannot only extract the current password, you can also extract all the old versions of your password that you have been using, given the password parameter. So if you have like a parameter setting of, you're not allowed to use the 13 last passwords, then you can extract <coughs> those 13 password hashes as well. And also, this is also one of the things that uh, Jan Stadek uh, helped me do is that he actually applied a Levenstein uh, edit distance matrix to those data. So I could have your password like 24 generations back in time. Then he would apply Levenstein edit distance matrix for each and every password and also do an average value 
But based on that, it is pretty easy to say that most probably your next password is going to be your current password plus one. Because on average, the edit distance was very low, actually, if you can use levels like edit distance as, you know, in a way to uh, look for patterns and how you would change your passwords. That also means, and um, what I try to do is that even if we get compromised today and I tell all of you to change your password, there's a pretty big chance that, you know, 50% of you would do the plus one trick. Now, if I have your current password, I do know something that I might be able to use to catch your next password. If I actually have your 10, 20, 30 last passwords available as well, and I manage to crack all of them, then it makes it much easier to look for what kind of pattern are you using to generate your passwords. Because in 20 generations, you may have changed your, you know, password generation algorithm one or twice or maybe three times. So if you have the entire history, it gets much more interesting to look at the, the history and try to see for look for patterns in it. So I like really do not analyzing just current passwords, but password history of users and accounts. So simply put password history can actually be a really bad thing for you and for your company, your organization, unless you do it some way correct. And most organizations are doing password history totally wrong. Also, when it comes to passphrases, I think passphrases are a really interesting thing to discuss. And two days ago, Sunday evening, I went into Jeremy and I said, uh, Jeremy, uh, when you did the analysis of the LinkedIn, passwords. How did you actually say that this is a passphrase and this is not a passphrase? And I'm sorry Jeremy, but I didn't really like your, the way you explained it to me because what I think, and there's, there's a paper from Cambridge that talks about passphrases and essentially what they are saying in that paper is that they have been researching a little bit into passphrases and to them, at the moment now, it only looks to them as passphrases are just marginally better than an ordinary password. I really want us to come up with a better definition of what is a passphrase and what is a password. So it makes it easier to differentiate between them when we are analyzing, you know, leaked passwords as an example. And this one... Uh, <laughs> I, one of the lab rats that I'm using is my own mother. mother. She is completely not serious, <coughs> she is not interested in computer security at all. And she's working as a nursery teacher. So she will usually tell me that, you know, hey, as soon as she starts exercising and actually takes care of your own personal security, then I might listen to you talk about passwords. She has a really good point. Your health is actually more important than your passwords. And after this, from XKCD, there was, you know, everybody started to discuss how good or how bad is it to use correct or time receivable. And of course, one of the first things that came up is that, well, if you now decide to use correct or time receivable as your password, then you, 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 know, you know, you're like dead fish in the water, period. Because now, from now on, everyone, all hackers will you try correct false battery staple when they try to brute force or use dictionary tags. I will give a lot of credit to a girl that actually I don't still don't know her name. Uh, her Twitter handle is Sacmus. And she also did one of her rare blog posts, why passwords really suck. She refers to the XKCD and she would be, she is referring to uh, my blog posts as well. Because what, one of the things that she says, she's an American, and she says that although there might be 100,000 or 600,000 or 200,000 words in the English language, how many words do you think an average American actually knows about? Hey. And you guys, the Americans, stopped laughing, so that's kind of funny already there. No, no, no. And, then, and, then, and, and then you also have, out of the words that you actually know about, how many of those are you actually using in your everyday language? 
So if we are to say that you would be constructing any kind of pass phrase based on words you know, we can actually reduce the key space into words that you will most probably be using, which is a lot less than the number of words you actually know in your head. Never mind that you're able to spell. Huh? And that you're even able to spell, correct? <laughs> yeah, well, misspelling words, would, I, I would say that would make a nice trick for past races in a way. <laughs> So, many years ago, I looked at two different government organizations here in Norway that does password policy advice. And if you go look for public advice from the Norwegian government, you will find these two different organizations. And several years ago, I went through their websites looking for, you know, password policy advice and made two very simple columns and a list of all the different recommendations they do, this is Norwegian, so you can use, you know, Google Image Translate if you like. But, I mean, these recommendations are completely insane from a usability perspective. The most interesting thing is that there were only three recommendations that were actually to be found to be similar on both sides. And they were minimum length of eight, use uppercase and lowercase in your passwords, yes, and last one, use shortened sentences, like you would use the first character in each word in a large sentence. And then I would reply back to them, so why can't you just write the entire sentence instead? That would be much easier, and you would have a much longer password. So they removed most of that advice, and the advice they are giving today, that are unified, is pretty close to being what I want them to give out as advice to Norwegian people, so I'm kind of proud of that one. Yeah. <laughs> Marcus, are you happy? Marcus. Oh, too early. Germans. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, he talked about using uh, quite a bit of personal information yesterday on analyzing people's passwords. Now, again, with the help of Jan Fredrik, one of the things that we did, we went through more than 5,000 headshots of people, classifying them in different categories, like hair color, facial hair, male or female, and if the people were using glasses or not on these pictures, more than 5,000. And we also had their passwords. <coughs> so if you are female and have red hair, you have the best passwords on average. While if you do look like a Unix guru, <laughs> male with a really wild beard and or hair, then you have the worst passwords. And even more interesting, to, you know, maybe to reflect the real life, we also saw that on average, women prefer length, while men prefer, should I say entropy or should I say variation? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm still talking about passwords actually. Yeah, so yeah. When you think about else, ah, good. Yeah, good, yeah. So, uh, a while ago I went to a conference to talk about, you know, passwords. And there was, uh, and I have a personal company name in, in English, Good Practice. I prefer the term good practice instead of best practice because you can't prove that your advice is the best practice available in the entire world. So I say, I, I will give you good practice. Some, something else could be better now or in the future, but I will try to give you good practice advice. So there's this guy coming up with this one, saying that one. In, you know, in the old times, we had old practices, and nobody can really remember how that was, but it was really, really old, so we don't talk about that anymore. Then we have bad practice, which is, you know, common phrase. And then there's current practice, what we do today. And then came good practice. And I was like, yay, good practice. Yeah, that's me. And then somebody says, well, there's back practice. And then there will also be next practice. What's that going to be? So, and I already registered the company name. So <laughs> I was a little unsure what to do. But yeah, I, I think that's a nice one. So best practices is, in my head, 
pretty close to we need to be compliant. <coughs> now, how many here really love the term we need to be compliant? Raise your hands. Oh, yeah. Love, you mean mark? <laughs> no, I actually, <laughs> no, no. Love as you would normally interpret it in, in, in English. Yeah. So, PCI DSS, which some of you know, has these password requirements. A minimum length of seven. It has to be alphanumeric, not mixed alphanumeric, only alphanumeric. You need to change your password every 90 days. And I've been meeting a couple of PCI DSS auditors, and they are really not interested in, in discussing any kind of trade-off, saying that, if I say that, well, I will do minimum length 15, and in exchange for that, I will tell people that you only have to change your password you know, every once in a year, or maybe once every second year. They're not even willing to discuss it because they say, if I will allow you to do that, there's a pretty high chance I will you know, lose my certification as a PCI auditor. So I, I really can't do that. That's kind of stupid, because then you're not really interested in having, giving any advice. You're just protecting your own ass, pretty much. So to me, we're combined it equals crap for most parts. So applied risk analysis is, is you know, it's very easy to illustrate. And I have written uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a blog post on your official Adcomsoft blog, saying that you really oh well, why you should crack your own passwords. Now, to me it's pretty simple. If you don't crack the passwords in your company or in your organization, I really don't think you have no idea about what the risk is actually about. You can implement all kinds of measures and countermeasures to prevent your hashes to be stolen and blah, blah, blah. But I really think you need to try to crack them as well, because if you're capable of cracking them in like a couple of seconds, somebody else might do the same thing as well. I'm not a technician anymore. I suck at math. I don't know much about cryptography and I can't do any kind of programming at all. So I like to look at passwords a little bit more into, you know, in a psychological way. At specialforces.com that week showed us that there were, there were lots of, there was a main audience, main participants in that forum, and the passwords were, I would say, typically male. While at Hamilton.com, which is, uh, well, it was a, a, a sex um, escorting service from Norway, which is illegal in Norway, by the way, uh, and they got hacked last winter in October and uh, November. Uh, approximately 26,000 accounts leaked, and that is most probably the biggest leak ever in Norway so far, 26,000 accounts. Approximately 2,000 women and 24,000 customers, oh, sorry, men, uh, in there. And I have never, ever before seen that many foul words and sexually related words at such a site. So what I'm interested in looking for even better is, again, back to this classification of words into, you know, male, female passwords. And can we eventually also adjust our word lists into what kind of service system are you actually attacking to even further do key space reduction when we are not actually brute forcing but doing intelligent password attacks. <coughs> System generated passwords. Also, I did a blog post about, uh, you know, where, I, where essentially I said that your own internal help desk and your external service desk for your customers is essentially your biggest risk, your biggest risk in any organization towards your end users. Because if an end user has a problem trying to figure out, so I need to make a good password, how do I do that? Well, if you work at help desk and you're resetting 100 passwords per day, how in the world do you expect them to be good and creative and create good, unique passwords for each and every user dialing in? I don't think they will do that. I can actually prove that they don't. Most usually it will be a simple password and they will forget to ask the user, you need to change it, or set the user must change the password on next log on. They will usually forget to do that because there's a risk the user will then dive in again and say, I forgot the password, can you reset it, reset it even one more time? And Jan Felik, 
who is always disagree with, uh, disagrees with me. Always. He came up with a... <laughs> Sorry, say that? <laughs> no, you, no, you don't. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I was, you know, I was waiting for that one. Uh, uh, we didn't plan ahead, but he always give, gives me that answer. And it is, it is not post on the password letter policy. And in there, he had gen generated um, uh, a working code online, which is, you know, a random password policy uh, program. So you will select a password, and you, you will be given a random policy. And if you can't create a password according to that policy, at once, <coughs> the entire policy will change. So that way, every user will have completely unique passwords. And he actually got uh, quoted in the uh, paper of the PhD dissertation from Matt Brown on that one. Calling it a noble idea, but it would probably be a, a bit, you know, off, considering security usability. Someone called it evil yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's also something about usernames, because we haven't been talking about usernames. And during my password cracking, I have had access to the username, first name, last name, phone number, sex, age, address, about these users, even pictures of them. And what I have seen that on average, you will find one to two percent of all your employees, they will be using their first name, last name, or both of them as whole or part of the password. So, I mean, you can obviously, you can figure out the names of employees in a company, but if you can also figure out the usernames, which is not considered a secret at all, then it gets even easier to get access. So, dial in and say, hi, I forgot the URL address for logging into the webmail system. Well, they will tell you on the help desk. That's, that's what they are there for. Same thing with username. Hi, this is Pierre Toursem, or this is Sebastian Raveur. I forgot my username. And they will tell you, because it's not a secret. Then the only thing I'm missing is the password. And, uh, you know, I forgot my password as well. Uh, yeah, you're supposed to send it to me by text message. You, well, uh, you know, I'm actually calling from Norway right now, and I'm using somebody else's phone because mine doesn't work in Norway. So what would happen, Sebastian? You don't have to answer. Don't. Don't answer, actually. Again, the discussion of what is a passphrase, I'm really interested in hearing more about that later on. Do we need a definition of it? I think we do, because it helps understand what we are actually searching for when we are analyzing password leaks. Am I over time? That's why I have a baseball bat. <laughs> Can it be done? Simplify Chinese as an example. How, would you, how on earth would you differentiate between words and, and phrases using simplified Chinese? Yes, my daughter, Windows 8 picture password. I think it has really good usability aspects. And um, Microsoft has two blog posts talking about the, I would say, the cryptography security of this solution. But what I haven't seen from Microsoft is anyone doing you know, a usability study where you will take, ask people, select a picture, any picture that you have on your phone, on your PC, and then you will use that as a picture password. And on your picture, you can use a dot, a line, and a circle. And the system will look for in which direction will you do your circle. And if you do a line, they will see where you start and where you end up with your line. And you also have just a simple dot. Now on a tablet, it is easy to make circles or lines with your finger. But on a screen, a normal computer screen, you would eventually have to use your mouse, which would make it much more difficult. So then I think, personally, there's a higher chance that people would only be using dots. So I would like to see somebody doing some kind of research, asking people, pick a, pick a picture, add a picture, and make three symbols. They can be circles, lines, and dots. And then I would like to see what kind of patterns we will be generating. Because, again, we can do key space reduction, and if you can steal somebody's tablet and they're using Windows Picture Password, there's a higher probability we can guess your uh, sequence. Even more interesting, Alcomsoft, Russian company Alcomsoft, discovered that UPEC fingerprint readers 
if you choose to use that, like I have now on my Lenovo ThinkPad, the fingerprint software is on top of the operating system. So in order to use fingerprint, the software will ask me to provide my Windows password. And then the fingerprint software will actually store my Windows password in the, using the Gospel encryption. And it's not really that advanced encryption either. It's, well, I would say it's really not encryption, really. And other ones have proved that they can very easily decrypt that password. So you have the password stored using a hash algorithm in the operating system, but now suddenly it's also stored using reversible encryption by, by the UPEX software. <coughs> I wrote something about this stuff, and then a Russian company, Passcape, made a comment on my blog post on this. Windows 8 picture password, as well as PIN, is just a toy with lack of security. Here's explained why. This blog post actually shows you that in Windows 8, if you choose to use a PIN code, which can be a minimum of four digits and a maximum of four digits, because you know, who would ever need anything else than 640 kilobytes of memory? So you can only do a four digit PIN. But if you use a PIN or picture password, then your Windows password will also be stored using reversible encryption. As regards Microsoft. I'm getting close now. Matt Holland at Wired got hacked. I presume most of you, if not all, have read his story. That story scared me shitless. Because they went on one side, uh, on, at one side on uh, Google, and found a piece of information that was in a way public, uh, publicly available. And the same piece of information was then being used as a secret at Apple. So they got access to his account. So I really would like somebody to do research into, let's say, the Alexa top 10 or top 100 websites to look at the entire process of registration account, magic questions, magic secrets that are being used, and compare them to each other to look at any other loopholes where we can actually find public information at one site that can be used to get access to another site. I got really scared about that one. <coughs> Couple of ideas, we can discuss that later on because I'm very over time, as I always am. But here are a few ideas that I would like to see happen. I will also put out the slides so I will, in a couple of minutes, so I will also tweet the link to, to my presentation, even with more links available on the handouts. And my big picture password is this. A couple of weeks, months ago, there was a teenage girl here in Oslo who got kidnapped and killed. And the police, Norwegian police, were using, among other things, they found her cell phone and one shoe at the site where she uh, most probably got kidnapped. And as far as I know, they got access to her Facebook profile and try to use that and other information as well to see if there were any suspicious information that could, that could help the police find her because they found her at, uh, I think it was uh, a week, two weeks dead. And I was called by a Norwegian newspaper asked, and they asked me, do you have, have any opinion on the police accessing her phone and her Facebook profile? Because in the media, they were saying that the police still doesn't have got access to a Facebook profile. So I replied back to them something that I have been doing for 12, 13 years. I've been telling people to write down their passwords. And what I said, I were quoted in 79 newspapers in Norway. 79, so that's pretty much all the newspapers in Norway. And what I said is, I want you to talk to your teenage kids. And I want you to tell them to write down a PIN code for the telephone, their Facebook password, their mail password, Instagram and Twitter, on a piece of paper. Put it into an envelope, close it, and on the front say, write down for emergency purposes only. I put that up in their rooms, so that if they do get kidnapped, which we are absolutely not hoping for, <coughs> their passwords have been written down, 
and that will help us and the police to find them. And that's a really good reason for why you should write on your passwords. And by that, I'm not going to say thank you for listening. I would say, do you want more work to do? Please contact me, how I am. <laughs> thank you.